So the question is, now that I'm older and also run a games criticism channel, how do games from my childhood stack up? Are there any that I view as lesser games now when I loved them when I was a kid? And are there any that have even gotten better in my eyes? So straight away, I can say that there are games that are story based and story driven that have not held up well. And the reason they haven't held up well is not because I am a games critic. They haven't held up well because I'm just an adult now. And a lot of them are for children and they're just not good if you're an adult. So even those stories that I like a lot, like Chrono Trigger, the early Final Fantasies, Final Fantasy IV especially, all those kinds. When I was a kid, Final Fantasy IV was riveting. And I do mean that with no exaggeration, just riveting. I was so enthralled with Final Fantasy IV's story. Um, <laughs> and yet you play it now, and I think there's a joke in one of my videos. I flash on the screen, Final Fantasy IV's defining characteristic was suicidal characters that have these grand monologues before they try and kill themselves to save the day. What's really weird is that, for whatever reason, Final Fantasy IV, I think, has been remade and remixed more than any other Final Fantasy game. Maybe some, there's a huge Final Fantasy fan in chat that will correct me if there's another game that's been remade. But I know there's, there's like the Game, game Boy Advance version, the, the DS version, which was made in 3D, uh, that, that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, parts of the story changed a lot between those versions. Um, I remember characters um, that died in the Super Nintendo version that come back to life in later versions, and it kind of ruins their sacrifice and it kind of cheapens it a little bit. Um, but yeah, anyway, to not get too off track, that story was riveting to me, and I played it as an adult, and I just don't care. It's just it's just such a bad story for an adult, but it's great for kids. Secret of Evermore is another one that I think that I enjoyed more as a kid. I won't as an adult, but there's a lot of sort of weird adult humor in that one, and by adult humor, I don't mean mature humor or like sex jokes or anything. I mean, there's a lot of parodies and references to B movies and stuff like that, that I don't think a kid growing up at the time that Secret of More came out would enjoy at all or even understand. And I didn't understand them when I was young. Maybe I'm wrong though, but yeah. So some of those old games are, are kind of weird when it comes to stories. And I think that's where I'm gonna lead into the main point of the older games is that I find that in terms of gameplay, and even structure, a lot of older games are quite elegant. They're focused, they're only about a couple of things. They have a point, they have this much more simple kind of main thing that they're trying to do. And that makes them quite appealing still. You can go back to a lot of those older games and you can just pick up and play. And normally you're in control and you're playing within seconds of hitting new game too. Of course, some RPGs aren't gonna be like that. Some RPGs are gonna take a little while to get warmed up, but you know, side scrollers, platformers, Mega Man X, you know, all those Super Nintendo games, NES games too, Tears of Might and Magic, Rygar, you know, stuff like those, Mario 3, you're gonna be playing within seconds and you get right into it and it's fun. It, a lot of them hold up, you know, you're running, jumping, hitting, shooting. And on that level, some of them have, might have even gotten better because a lot of games today try and do too much, I think. And that idea isn't wrong. It's not flawed to try to do too much. It's just the execution has to be there as well. And the execution often isn't there, unfortunately. So a lot of those games are still fun to go back. I think this is beyond the scope of the question, really. And I'd like to look at it a little bit more, actually, because it's, it's making me think right now what's been lost from then to now just you know this this playability this pure playability so yeah the, the, to answer your question most games have held up if they're focused on gameplay and i've probably enjoyed them more i really enjoy Mega Man x is still one two and three i don't know which one's my favorite of those i think there's going to be a collection coming out soon and I've, i haven't really played anything after three that extensively i think i've beaten four but any of the ones that came on the playstation i can barely remember i played them only a little bit and those have held up anything that's action focused. Um, it's the RPGs that kind of haven't even in terms of gameplay because it's just kind of boring now. Um, Secret of Mana is probably the game that I enjoyed the most as a child and now I dislike the most as an adult. It's just really, really, oh, rip that guy. Sorry, sorry. Uh, just, just really, really slow, really tedious. Um, he's just staring in front, just like, don't move, and, you know, trucks are like T-Rexes, just don't- No, what are you doing? No! No, I was moving! Okay, just go. Just go. Just go, dude. Just go. Secret of Mana has probably held up the worst out of any game that I really, really, really loved as a kid. It just goes on for too long, the combat, you have these really annoying 
waiting sessions to get to 100% stamina in order to do another attack. Magic is just kind of busted. Uh, it's all slow. You run through menus. You have to wait for animations to play. Sometimes enemies just randomly go immune to damage because they're casting spells and you have no idea how to tell most of the time. At least that's how I remember it. You have to hold down the attack button to charge up these big mega long combos that take forever and slow you down while you're doing it. If you've played the game, you know what I'm talking about. It's not a bad game, but I loved that game when I was a kid, and I don't even think I could stomach it now to finish it. So that's probably the big one for me. Yeah, and anything that gets closer to RPG starts to dwindle a bit. Part of the reason why I like Final Fantasy VI so much, I think, is because the battles are so quick. You compare that to the later ones on the PlayStation, and just getting into battle just takes so long. You know, you have you have the zoom in and the go, and, and and then the battle starts in the music and the sweep across the battlefield, and then you select the, the the attack, and there's a wind up animation, and they travel across the, the level and they hit it. You know. Like, I think Final Fantasy VII is better than that than Final Fantasy VIII and IX, but it just, everything just takes so goddamn long, whereas Final Fantasy VI, it's all, it's all so quick. Even the summons are just really, really fast. Chrono Trigger is similar, and I like the active battle system and how Chrono Trigger has the enemies on the screen, but I would say even those two, which are some of my favorite games, haven't held up as... For PC games, Dungeon Keeper is something that I've grown to appreciate more and more as time has gone on. I think Dungeon Keeper is genuinely one of the best games that's ever been made. And I think a lot of that is an accident. I don't think that they intended it to be as good as it is. It's just a really, really, really great game for reasons I went to in the video. And I think that's it. I could probably keep going for an hour with more examples, but I think I've made my point for the most part. There's something to do with the simplicity of older games that is really appealing. And you can see it in stuff like Celeste and Super Meat Boy, games like that. Indies are tapping into that way more than the big game developers, but I don't know. Maybe I'm not right with what I'm saying right now. Maybe I'm just taking an easy avenue of discussion from what we just said and going with it. If I thought about it for a long time, maybe I would completely disagree with what I'm saying right now. Someone chat is saying, Joseph, what is the genre you can play multiple times without getting bored of? Personally, it's roguelikes. Want to hear about yours? Yeah, roguelikes are there, but it needs to be a specific game for me. Enter the Gungeon is a game that has a lot of longevity for me, and I played that for a long time, and it still has my attention. There's something about Dark Souls that really gets to me too. I don't know why. On the surface, Dark Souls isn't really a game that should have a lot of replayability, but I think there's just something about completely conquering a game like that that really appeals to me. I think other people too, because a lot of people replay it as well. I would likely be playing Neo a lot right now if I had time. I'd be going through that again and again and, and going through the same thing. Because I played Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 a lot over and over again. I didn't really play Bloodborne as much as I wanted to. But yeah, there's something appealing about that. Celeste would probably be another one as well. Celeste was fun, especially because of the hidden moves that are in that game. And I saw the speedrun recently, and, and that seemed like a lot of fun. I don't know, and, and any, any action-based system that has multiple solutions, for lack of a better term, that you can go through and you can experiment and you can do different things, I think is going to be able to hold my attention a lot. Puzzle games, obviously, you're not going to be playing them again and again. But you did say genres, you didn't say specific games. I don't know. I don't really stick to genres anymore, and my time with games is really skewed with channel work. But uh, clearly, if history has proven anything over the past year, it's Japanese RPGs that keep calling me back, right? They're my siren, ready to drag me down if I ever get too close. Maxine H says, What the frog is up, Joe and Lily? What the frog? Okay, I like that. So I've got this replica animal skull in my house now for photos that I just stare at sometimes. So I've become very inquisitive and introspective. So brace for some questions. Did you name it Yorick? In your prey video, when you mentioned the derelict shuttle and how you weren't sure what kind of reward should have been in the shuttle. I've been thinking about that while stroking my chin and staring at my animal skull, of course, <laughs> and came to the conclusion that when a game like Prey has its type of upgrade system, the reward should be some piece to top off that skill. For example, let's say the shuttle's door would have you doing the hardest hacking section in the game with the highest level skills required, and inside you get a piece of gear that enhances hacking altogether. Maybe now you can hack from a distance or something adding a new level of skill and flexibility to it. How do you feel about that idea? And do you have any other ideas after having some time of separation from Prey? Okay, so your idea is sound, but it's something that I think a lot of game developers and people who like to think about games go through. It's for this reason that I'm hesitant to say that reward systems are one of the more complicated things to get right in a game. Because... Those rewards don't exist in a vacuum, and 
you have to look at the gameplay side of things as well as the reward because the reward is always going to affect gameplay and there's going to be some ramifications for it. For those that don't know, the Derelict Shuttle in Prey is outside the space station that you're in in Prey and it's quite out of the way and there's a hard battle that you fight there. You first have to notice it, you have to fly all the way there, it's quite a journey. Then there's a fairly difficult battle there and then you get inside the shuttle and you're expecting that there's going to be something really good there and it's just some minor things and it's a bit of a disappointment especially considering it needs a very high hacking ability that you probably won't have when you first get there and then you're going to have to come back later and go all the way through that all over again to get quite a disappointing reward. And in the video I go on about how should something really good have been here but if you make it too good then it becomes sort of mandatory you have to come here to get it but if it's not good enough then it's not worth it so if, if we translate that to something like doom because i think doom will show this problem way more than hacking and prey so let's just say there's an equivalent of the derelict shuttle in doom about halfway through the game and if you finish it you get the equivalent of what maxine is saying here which is that you get a really powerful ability that affects the type of gameplay that you went through to acquire it. So you get a really, really, really powerful gun. Well, the problem with that is initially that's a great reward. It fits. You're getting rewarded in the same way that you were tested. But now gameplay is fundamentally changed because you have this really powerful weapon that might trivialize a lot of the encounters that you were probably enjoying up until now because that's why you pushed yourself to do the optional challenge, right? So by giving you this really, really powerful reward, you have ruin the game so it can't be too powerful so now you have to look at the rewards and think okay well it should be something that's fun and interesting but not really powerful and game destroying but then that seems like a really easy solution but then you have to think okay well if there's something like that that exists that is fun and interesting and worthwhile to go out over here then shouldn't that already be in the game right if you hide one of the coolest weapons that is well balanced, that fits your arsenal really, really well, and complements a lot of the game systems in your game, and you give that as a reward, as an optional side thing that a lot of people are going to miss, surely that's making your game a much lesser experience than if you had just made it part of the game from the get-go. So that means that it can't be there and you're back to the same problem again. See what I mean? It's not really that simple, right? So you want it to be something that's interesting and fun and worthwhile, but at the same time, it can't be too good and it can't be too interesting because otherwise it should just be part of the main game. Then you just kind of go round and round and round and round not really knowing what, where, 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 to, where to go with it. Um, so I think that <laughs> the solution is that you have to have the flexibility to have a game that has so many different options and so many different paths that you can explore systems that you can be brave enough to hide really fun things like that and really good things like that in the game and not feel like players are missing out a lot if they don't find them which i don't even know if you could point to a modern game that's done something like that in recent years at all i think the best kind of reward for me when it comes to things like that is how celeste does it which is the gameplay is the main draw, and once you get through an optional thing like that, you're rewarded with more of the gameplay that you've been enjoying up until that moment. But your idea for Prey isn't bad, because I think the example you gave isn't too game-breaking. And it's fun, but it's not essential, so even though I just went on that big rant there, I think your example of a long-distance hacking sort of tool that makes things a bit more fun, but not too broken, I think that's actually a pretty good example for that area. But at the same time, you have to look at it and think, okay, well, if your hacking system is sort of boring, is a system that destroys the need to do some of it really that good? And if that's the case, shouldn't the question be that you should be redesigning your hacking system instead of putting something in there that makes people be able to bypass it? But then that gets into an even larger question, which is, is inconveniencing a player and making them go through some tedium an actual worthwhile thing to do and the more i look at games and the more i play games the more i'm starting to think that the answer to that question is yes that there is value in tedium and there is value in in making the player do something that they're not really enjoying and they're not really having fun just not in every game um i don't think in something like celeste or odyssey or breath of the wild or anything like that um a, a very sharply gameplay focused game i don't think it's worth it there but for something that's going for more of an experience something that's going for a story um, I think there's definitely 
some merit in in um in things like that i'm on the wrong side of the road now because i'm in europe because uh, i'm in the uk i should have known that did they really drive on the right side of the road in in most of europe did they really i didn't know that i think that a good way of doing something in prey would have been incremental increases to speed carry weight <clears throat> a jump height fuel for your jetpack wrench damage that sort of thing that are completely separate from everything else. Things that do not give you a choice. I think choices are good, and I think there should be choices in almost every game, especially when you're exploring and picking up loot. But I also think there should be lots of cool stuff that you just get, and you never have to sit there and go, oh, should I trade this out for a different enhancement slot? And oh, is this worth spending the points on? And oh, should I save this for later? Now, I think in addition to that sort of system that you have to make choices and weigh options, I think there should be just, you get to this area, you see an upgrade, you go over, you pick it up, and just boom, you get an increase. I think that it's fun, it's quick, you're always happy because even if it's something that you don't really use that much, it's not costing you anything, and they can be little incremental boosts. So even if you miss them, they can be placed everywhere and you could still have a lot of fun with them and the game doesn't have to worry about balance issues because you could put like 20 of them all over the place and that's 20% more damage to your wrench attack. Well, 20% isn't really that much, but it still feels good to get them, right? So that's what I think is a good sort of middle ground if you don't want to put in so much work with building entire different game mechanics that some people might miss that complement your game system. But I'm really, I'm curious, and this will be what I end on because I'm going on for, I'm waffling on a little bit too much and being waffles data upon. I'm really curious if there has been a modern game that has put in that effort and has had these hidden secret areas with mechanics that really do switch up a lot of things. Oh, we got speeding, oh no. I'm curious if that exists because I think it would be pretty difficult. Yeah, I think that's it. Hope that was a good answer. I wanted to ask you how you value your experience in your first playthrough when judging the game. For example, when I watched your Breath of the Wild video, I agreed that the shrines were pretty bad, but I didn't really care or notice about how bad they were until I played on Master Mode, which sort of bumps the game's score up for me. Maybe this thinking is kind of flawed, but what do you think about experiences like, the, like this? First playthrough is the most important for me, and I know some people might get angry about that because sometimes I stream my first playthroughs. Um, I I got a really really angry email one time saying that uh, you know how how dare you stream near Automata, and do do you really think that you would have enjoyed the the what remains of Edith Finch if you had been sitting there with 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 your wife talking about how you want to buy a, a sexy maid suit for her. <laughs> Like, it's a really, really, really long email. And, uh, like, seriously, it went, it went on for, like, a couple thousand words, I think. Um, and and he i i i i appreciate the the passion for for, for the game and, and that he, and that he wants me to have a you know an, an untarnished first playthrough but um the thing is is that those conversations usually happen when there's a lull and and we're doing some boring side content that you know there's a reason why i'm having those conversations is because the game isn't engaging me a lot at that moment and also i said it before on stream just when i'm not streaming doesn't mean you know i'm locked in an isolation tank with you know five feet of steel in every single direction with my headphones on and another pair of bigger headphones over that you know with sunglasses with fucking cardboard cutouts on the side so all i can see is is the screen like, like these conversations i have with lily and the kids they still happen even when i'm not streaming you know almost all of dark souls 3 and bloodborne and even what remains to be the finch you know i either had a kid on my lap or lily was talking to me at the same time because that's just how my life is you know i watch or, you play most of the games so yeah i sit there and watch and it, i we we talk it's, well, like we do it in silence. It's how it is, you know? It might be a little different now that I have some separate space, but yeah, that's how it was. And, and apparently my work was good up until that moment, so I think it still qualifies. But anyway, yeah, the first experience is the most important. I will say, even having gone on that little mini rant there, there is something to be said that maybe there are some games that I shouldn't stream my first playthrough on, especially if they are completely story heavy. But sometimes I haven't decided I'm going to do a video on a game until after I've played it. And I think I get most of the experience quite well, even on a stream. The scary version is that there might be games that I've enjoyed more because I'm streaming them because I have chat to keep me kind of engaged and I can talk aloud as I'm going through it. I think that's the scarier conversation. Not that I don't enjoy it enough on my first time through is that that, that streaming makes me enjoy it more. I think definitely Persona 5 and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 were vastly enhanced by streaming it and the interaction and, you know, like, we have people drawing pictures of things that are going on as I'm playing it. You know, like, I, I would be 
an idiot if I said that that wasn't influencing how much I'm enjoying my time with the game at that moment and that I'm going to have to do some work to try to separate that reaction right inside of me from how I feel about the game on its own. And I think I do that fairly well, but still that's the scarier version. Yeah, so I think the first playthrough is definitely the most important. I'm a firm believer that you should go into games knowing as little about them as possible. Ideally, if you see a trailer for a game and the trailer catches your interest and it's a little teaser trailer that you should not watch any other trailers after that, you're just you're just ruin, you're potentially ruining things for yourself and you should try and figure out as much of it on your own as, as you possibly can because that's what the games are supposed most games are built for. I think Breath of the Wild and Odyssey as well are two games that are much better your first time through and the cracks will show a lot more on your second time, especially Breath of the Wild. I tried to play Breath of the Wild again because all I had while we were doing this move was the Switch while I was going back and forth and I was playing a little bit of Switch games. I got Hollow Knight, I played that a little bit on the Switch. Didn't really get into it that much on the Switch actually, I don't know why. And yeah, I tried Breath of the Wild and it's just knowing that there's all those shrines ahead of me and how boring they are and how lackluster they are was just, oh no man, like just, it, it really, it really brings me down. And I, I, I think going into a shrine and you don't know that it's going to be bad and you can always like pretend that, oh, you know what, maybe I just hit all the bad ones in a row and maybe that will be good and then they're not. And yeah, I, th I think, I think that's, a, that, that's a big thing. I think a lot of people ruin the first experience for themselves by spoiling too much, either by reading stuff online, watching too many trailers, or, you know, they're so hungry to play it and people have, have, have got early copies and they're on discussion forums. Tell me the details. What was the first area like? And what what what, what you do next time, you know? And, 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 all, and all these other things. And I think that can ruin a game for you. You're able to take some distance from your own opinion to separate I like, dislike this from this is good, bad. That said, is there any kind of feature in games that you personally enjoy or hate so much that you wouldn't completely trust yourself to give a fair critique of a game featuring it? Uh, thank you for saying that because I do try to distance myself from my own tastes and judge something for the goals it's trying to do. I think that some people don't see that sometimes because I am quite critical, especially when I get into this mode where I talk about how, you know, I think that this could be done better. Here's some suggestions. A lot of people think that my suggestions are me trying to be a game designer. And although I would love to design a game one day, I know full well that whatever the game that I design first is probably gonna be so bad that it shouldn't even be released, that it's just gonna be a learning process. I am not a game designer whatsoever. Why I go into suggestions is because the way I was taught mostly self-taught through judging reactions from people was that um, my, my basis of criticism we can't even get out of the truck the, the parking lot um, is is from is from reading other people's writing um, and learning a lot from re reading other people's writing giving critiques of people's work on discussion forums and stuff was just as much for me as it was for them and a good way of doing that was always to give examples of what you're saying and also to be constructive and provide examples of what could be done better in a way that makes sense and isn't just, you know, this is shit, good luck fixing it, you know what I mean? So that's where that comes from. So yeah, sometimes the examples are there to say, look, I think there's a line in the Breath of the Wild video, you know, like I can think of solutions and I'm just, I'm just me with my YouTube channel, not a legendary developer at Nintendo. They should have realized this and done a better job. Um, my suggestions may not be the best, but they're something and they're still better, in my opinion, than, than what, what was happening. Um, most people who disagreed with them didn't even give any answers. They just said, you know, you suck and your suggestions are bad and, and they don't say why. You know, I, I think that having a tailored list and, and of, of shrines that can scale in complexity and then they're scrambled within their own kind of tiers is a really good idea and there's no real downside there because you keep the variety you keep the variance between playthroughs and between people who are playing the game and also you get to build on complexity and and, and you're not caught you're not stuck with these really boring shrines at the end and um and concepts that can't go anywhere it's like the, there's, there's nothing really wrong with that idea i think i even had someone who is a game developer who emailed me afterwards and said um that would have been really easy for them to do it's it's not a hard thing to do at all but yeah that i'm that's that's i'm getting i'm getting off track there with that it's difficult to keep yourself distanced from from a lot of things because 
once you get into suggestions like that, it, it can it can sound like you're not judging the game as it is, and instead for, for what you want it to be, and that kind of harkens back to the question that we just had about stories. Someone left a comment on the Minute Review and said, you know, you didn't judge this game properly because you are comparing it to what you wanted it to be and what you thought it would be when you, when you, uh, when you read the description and, instead of what it actually is. And there's some merit to that to that comment but at the same time i think that my viewpoint was valid because that's what i really expected it to be and that's what i think the game sort of advertised itself as and that's what the mechanics seem to be lending itself to whereas i think a comparison would be if you see a game that's trying to advertise itself as a really intense platformer like meat boy or celeste and then you get it, and it turns out that it's it's mostly an, an RPG with a really engrossing story, and you're going to be spending a bunch of time in menus and shit. I think that, you know, it's valid for you to say, hey, I was expecting something really different, and it wasn't there, and I'm upset, and I think you have a right to be upset. Whereas the same argument can be made against you're judging it for what you want it to be instead of what it is. I don't know. I also think that in those videos, because I've done it in other videos, not just Minute, I think I usually say in the videos, okay, well, if we take away all the stuff about what I would prefer it to be, how is it if we just judge it for what it is and just pretend that those expectations weren't there? And I think I do a pretty good job doing that, and I include it in almost every video that I go off on, on those kind of, kind of tangents and comparisons, and we're going to hit every single one of these. I don't think I would ever do... I don't think I'd ever do a racing game. Um, as you can see, I can't drive. Yeah, never do a racing game. They just don't interest me. The only racing games that I've ever really enjoyed have been Mario Kart, Destruction Derby, and Burnout. Those are the only three racing games I've ever enjoyed. I tried to play Gran Turismo, and I hated it. It's boring. I don't like it. I tried to play, I think, a Forza game at some point, Ridge Racer. I don't like them. There needs to be something more. It needs to be a bit more arcadey for me to enjoy it. So the power-ups and, and the wacky kind of weird things in Mario Kart. But even then, it has to be done well. Diddy Kong Racing was nowhere near as good as Mario Kart 64 IMO. Maybe there could be a good game based on the Wacky Races show. That was always kind of fun. Yeah, but Mario Kart was it for me. That's probably my favorite racing game. Burnout has, like, you go really, 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 really fast, and you have all the, the, the turbo and nitro boosts and shit. There's just such an awesome sense of speed in that game that's really, really great. Gran Turismo appealed to me more about the progression of getting a car, getting money, winning races, getting a better car, improving on it. That part was interesting to me. Yeah, maybe that's sort of an answer to Ralph Clogs' question earlier, that, you know, that, that that's not the biggest part of that game, but yet that's what I wanted out of it. I think that's definitely a genre that I'll avoid. I'm starting to think that maybe I just shouldn't properly review horror games, and I can go and make a video on a horror game, and I can talk about the story, and I can talk about the gameplay, but when it comes to the scares, I, I mean, I don't think I'm hard-boiled. I hate jump scares. Jump scares usually work on me, and I get startled, especially in movies. I don't enjoy being startled. I like being creeped out, but I don't like being startled. But for some reason, I don't know, like, Every horror game that I've ever played, I've just kind of went, you know, like that guy at the end of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Sora is really giving the heart to heart and he just goes, huh? And, and that's kind of my reaction to a lot of scary things in games. You know, Resident Evil 7 on stream, as most people saw, and then, you know, Soma as well and Amnesia. My reaction to most scares is just to go, huh? You know, like, okay, whatever. You know, I was laughing at most of Resident Evil 7. I thought the game was really, really funny. Yeah, so maybe I'm not qualified to do that because for whatever reason they just don't get to me. I don't think that I would do a good job and I don't think I could remain properly objective with a lot of simulation games that are really, really tightly tuned on the simulation part. There needs to be a game, there needs to be goals for me. I tried to play Planet Coaster recently and I fucking hated it even though I feel like that's a game that I should really enjoy. Theme Park was better, it was more fun for me when I was a kid, but maybe if I went back I wouldn't like that anymore. Theme Hospitals, I think I enjoy more, whereas Planet Coaster is just like, you just build a theme park, and I think you need a level of investment and imagination and a love for those kind of things going in that just I just do not enjoy. Um, I think that's, that's why I didn't take to some of the later Dungeon Keeper games and their clones because uh, there's, there isn't that big of a mix of goals with fun things and freedom than there is in the first game. That's why the first one's my favorite, I think. There's probably other genres as well, but the one I'll end on is uh, fighting games. And I will never do a video on a fighting game unless I have played the same fighting game for like three fucking years because you need to be really good at multiplayer games in order to judge them. 
and fighting games are all multiplayer. That's what they're all about. And if you you're like no one plays a fighting game to, to 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 fight fucking bots and and that's what it's all about. And they appeal to me. There's like I I, I I'm interested in learning one eventually, but I am not there at all. And I um I don't have the time. Uh, so that is not so much about staying objective. That's about qualifications. I'm not qualified to judge a fighting game, so I won't do it. Yep, yeah, I think that's it. Have you played any of the Thief games? It is my favorite video game series. And I think especially the earlier parts are outstanding and having organic gameplay that feels less gamey as most of the recent games that came out. Would you be interested in making a video on it? No. Next question. <laughs> there we go. It's the same person. So there you go. So we gave you everything we had on, on the 13 reasons why. So hopefully you'll accept that. Next question. What do you think is a game that has a whole leveling crafting upgrading system bolted on that overcomplicates a straightforward experience? Is that the whole question? Yes. All of them. All of them. Um I, I'm 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 only being half joking right now. All of them. Uh yeah. I, I think I think the only games that really benefit from them is our games like we're playing right now, where you're building towards something and you're building options as you go through. If your game isn't building options through that system and instead it's just making numbers go up, then it's cookie clicker and you're lying to the people that are playing it and you should feel bad because it's cookie clicker. That's why cookie clicker is the most important game that you can ever play and that'll be the title of a video one day. Cookie clicker is the most important game that you can play because progression systems that don't give you options are just cookie clicker. Darkest Dungeon to some extent not all of it, but to some extent, yeah. No Man's Sky. Of course there's going to be some gray area, but I would say that even in the times that there's a gray area, that almost every single case it would be better if it was removed. Maybe it gets more difficult in games like Dark Souls because to me Dark Souls' level system isn't good because of the progression. It's good because it gives death meaning. So I don't know if that's the, why it was designed that way, but to me the fact that your first time through souls are so valuable because you want to upgrade the stats because you think they're so important. They're not. You think they are. You don't want to lose those souls because you want to level up as much as you possibly can and get stronger because you're struggling because it's a hard game. Every single time you die, you're like, oh man, those fucking souls, I need to go back and get them. No, 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 no. And, and, and it gives a bunch of tension. And I think that's worth the, the bullshit and the clunkiness of the upgrade system and leveling system more than anything else. Um, and I guess I guess the reason why it's okay is that when, once you realize that it, it's not really that important, you can just ignore it and you don't care anymore. Um, upgrading your, your weapon is is way better and getting your stats to the, to the level that you can use certain weapons is, is way more important. And like you, you need surprisingly very few souls to do that in most cases. Um, especially if you know where a lot of items are in the world. Um, for some builds that have really, really high-end weapons that, you know, you need you need a 40 of a stat or something or 32. Um, okay, yeah, you, you, now suddenly souls are, are worth it again, but not really that much still, you know? So, I don't know. But I, I still think souls would benefit from, from a mode that doesn't. You can just ignore that completely. Um, I think that Neo uh, has some merit to its system but i also think that that would be a game that could be improved if you could just ignore it completely maybe if you know you could turn it off for your first playthrough and you just play it more like a devil may cry kind of deal that sort of thing yeah so i, I know it may sound like i'm flippantly dismissing a, a whole system of games but um i hate it i really do um yeah i i, I hate the Oh, go and sit in a room and kill shit for a while, and then oh, now now your health is 105 instead of 100. Oh, whoop de fucking do! I much prefer it if you just find things by exploration in the world that make it better. You know, so Hollow Knight, Super Metroid system, Metroid Prime, Metroidvania is really are, are good at that because there's such an exploration. It's open ended. I mean, you pick something up and and, and it's just here. Boom! You, you're just better now. You didn't need it, but you're just better. You have more options. You know, you can you can take more hits, and you didn't have to grind for it it's just there so if you classify that as a progression system then then okay the, the the conversation can go in a different direction but when i heard the question i immediately thought of just grinding and rpg stats and stuff like that i really i really don't like that at all i get annoyed by it i think it got in the way in god of war i will talk about that in the god of war video usually the worst thing that comes of it is that it makes things hard to balance because now you have to think okay well Every single fight that's in a game 
has to be made with a minimum amount of leveling and gear in mind and to some extent a maximum too because you want to be within those two ranges otherwise it's going to be too easy or it's going to be way too difficult so if you have a system it's like okay well how do i make sure that players are within that goldilocks zone what if they're way above it do i tune the fight harder if they are well if that's the case then why even have the leveling system at all if you're just going to automatically tune it to whatever level they are That's just adding a leveling system for no goddamn reason. Okay, well, am I going to make it so you have to be a minimum level to get into this area? Some games do that. If you're not this level, you can't get in. Okay, well, now you're just making me go grind for no reason, and you're making me do pointless mundane bullshit because I got here without grinding, and now suddenly you're not letting me in. You know what I mean? It doesn't work that way either. So I think it's a bad trap to fall into. Whereas if you have a more straightforward system of your character never really gets that much stronger in terms of how much damage they do and how much life they have, then you can balance it around that much easier. Hollow Knight system, you know, the difference between your mid-range character that finds only a couple health upgrades to someone that finds them all, you know, it helps, but it's not a big difference. But I would say Hollow Knight fails in that the weapon upgrades are just bonkers. The last stage of the weapon upgrade is way too powerful, in my opinion, but from reading the responses from what I said in the video, most people really disagree with me on that, so maybe I'm wrong when it comes to Hollow Knight, and maybe that's not a flaw, but it definitely was for me. I think that the one before it was was high enough, maybe even the one before that, and that's good. It's too extreme of a difference between where you start and the last one. Yeah, so I don't know. I think that developers should be able to do whatever they want, obviously. That's one of those things that I say sometimes, and immediately I think, why did I even bother saying it? It goes without saying. But that's just me prefacing the next statement. That is, I I wish that there was an option to turn a bunch of that stuff off whenever a game launches with it. I would like Dark Souls without it. I would like Neo without it. I don't want to grind. I don't want to have to, you know, I'm enjoying this game and it's so much fun and I'm, and I'm killing shit and, you know, I'm getting loot, like loot's a different thing, but then I suddenly have to sit down and look at this, this, this fucking 20 pages of stats and their explanations and, oh, what does this do? And, oh, does dexterity in this game mean avoidance or is it also tied to damage because sometimes it's not there? Are they just going to call life life or HP or are they going to call it vigor or is that tied to stamina somehow? And, oh, is, is strength just carry weight or is it d- dealt with, you know, like that's damage? Like, it's just, I don't give a fuck, you know what I mean? I just want to play the goddamn game and it just slows it down. But, I don't know, maybe I'm jaded when it comes to these things. I do think that there's merit for progression systems and they can provide rewards that otherwise wouldn't be there. So I'm not ready to write them off just yet, but if I made a game, I think I would really look at what the purpose of the system is and I think I would probably spend way too much time trying to figure it out and do I really have the best system and probably waste more time than than it's worth, but it's important to me. This may be a band-aid option that doesn't fix much, but if all of the low effort wounds in Odyssey were a different collectible, like gems in Spyro or Precursor Orbs that are explicitly a tier below moons and don't pause the game every time you pick one up, would it improve matters? Yes, but okay, so he, here, here's where I wish that, you know, at some point in the future we can make, you know, a real-time simulation of the universe and we can run changes through and see what people would think. What would the world be like if, you know, really important question, you know, what would the world be like if Dark Souls was never made? You know, like what, what, like let's let's run it through the simulation and see what, what happens. Um, I would really like to see what what the consensus would be in in Odyssey if this was what you're saying is 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 real. Like if that actually happened, because I want to say that I would have enjoyed the game more, but I also think that most people would have enjoyed it less when they reviewed it because I think if you take away all those garbage filler moons and you made them star fragment bigger, though, you know, like. I don't know. I think that most people would realize just how little content there is in the game that is worthwhile because suddenly it doesn't get mixed in with these filler moons because a lot of people don't agree that they are filler moons. They think that they're fine and it's so much content and it's so much fun. And if you took them all out or you made them something else, I think then it's you see how bare bones the game really has to offer. So I think it would have been a worse game according to a lot of reviewers, but I think for critics that thought the game was subpar like me, and there are, let me tell you, there are dozens of us. There are at least 11, at least 11 of us, you know, thought Odyssey was maybe, maybe not a masterpiece, at least. I think they would probably have said, you know, it's, it's a bit better, but it still has a lot of problems. I think that, you know, the reviews would have been lower too. 
which I think is kind of funny and I would like to know for sure if that was it. So yeah, I better get on the simulation so we can run it through and see because that's the most important thing we can do in the simulation. Yeah, but overall it wouldn't really change much of the, the structure of the game, right? It would just be a little faster. You wouldn't be sitting there, you know, drumming your fingers, you know, like, oh, we have to go sit through this animation again. But I also wonder if maybe, because perception matters a lot, right? There, there, there are things that you say. Okay, so let's let's go back to the Hollow Knight video. There's a really, really obvious thing in Hollow Knight that I didn't notice until I went back and played Ori in the Blind Forest. And if I hadn't gone back and played Ori in the Blind Forest for the Hollow Knight video, I probably wouldn't have noticed this. And, and it's so important, too. It's so important to realize that there's no sloped surfaces in Hollow Knight that the whole thing is, is based on a grid and built on a grid and there's probably a very simple level maker that they did and the lack of slope surfaces made it so much easier to arrange and put it together like that. The blocks are all the same size, they're all the same shape, it's just that they have a different tile set that goes along with them. Everyone's messed around with an RPG maker at some point probably, at least if, if they're close to my age. And I'm sure there's probably a tool that Team Cherry has that's like that, that slope surfaces just couldn't fit into for whatever reason or, or whatever. And that's just that's such a simple observation, right? And yet I didn't notice it until I went back and, and played Ori, and I've seen comments and people didn't notice it when they played the game either. So I wonder if there weren't so many filler moons, like, was that the most important thing for me while playing that game? Because if you watch my stream, very, very early on, I start to say, was that worth the moon? Was that worth the moon, really? You know? And how much of that kind of built over the whole playthrough when, you know, I started to question all the other moons that were in the game too, right? So if if that was gone, if, if suddenly all those filler moons are gone, maybe I would have enjoyed myself time with it for longer and I wouldn't, and the monotony and, and, and the what the fuck is this game would have set in later and I would have overall enjoyed my time with it more because there, there wasn't that kind of breadcrumb that led me to realize that most of the game was filler trash, you know? Which is scary, huh? Like, th that's... That's how small of a thing that, that, that matters when it comes to perception. It doesn't change the game at all, it's just your perception of it. Yeah, I don't know. The Last Isolith is mostly unchanged in the remaster. Given the opportunity, how do you think the planned level could have matched the quality of the better half of the game? Oh, that's an interesting question. Oh, wow. Can I take this question in a direction that I get to redesign it? Because I would enjoy that. It's going to be my thoughts anyway, right? So what else could I possibly do? So yeah, I think that the best way the Lost Isolith could be improved and brought up to the rest of the game and also fix the back half would be if Lost Isolith was like a foundation hub level that linked to all the rest of the worlds, all the rest of the levels around the second half. Uh, and to some extent the, the first half too. So Lost Isolith would be probably three times as big or there would be roots that lead back up from the ass dragon lava lake at the bottom that go back up to the surface, you know, more of those trees, maybe a couple of the elevators that, you know, won't reset after you call them, things like that, stairs, different connecting areas that lead back up to the surface and somehow, and, and there's this huge foundation at the bottom of the world that, that that's, you know, really, really feels holistic with, with, with the rest of the world in souls. I think that would be really good and you can explore all these different ways and you can have all these moments of, you know, breaking through a secret area and then suddenly you're you're back in Undeadburg or you're back in Duke's archives or you're back here, you're back there or a place that you've never been before if, if Lost Isolith is one of the first places that you go. I think that would be pretty fun. I think that would be really, really good and I would have enjoyed doing that and it would have brought the interconnectivity of the first half into the second half of the game. Is that feasible? Is that realistic? Probably not because it would be a lot of development time and maybe a lot of players would get tired of climbing up all these different areas and so maybe it wouldn't work, but I would say one of the biggest flaws of Dark Souls second half is that it doesn't have that interconnected feel of the world that the first half did, so I think that would be really good. It could be that after you kill the Witch of, sorry, Beta Chaos, that causes some sort of eruption, you know, there's a reaction to you killing that boss, or you kill another boss before before that, that causes, an, you know, all the lava to recede, and that causes things to change up top in the world, and that causes a big change there, and that opens a bunch of paths. Um, I think that could be kind of cool. Um, yeah, I, I just think that it's, it, it seems to me that Lost Isolith was meant to be a much more grand, much more important area than it was, and the fact that it's that large and has three bosses and it's just crammed with so many enemies. It makes me think that they had a big idea for that area, even though I think they outsourced it and that they want to do more with it and they just didn't. So they just threw a band-aid, you know, put a band-aid on it by, by, by making it in its current state. Bed of Chaos obviously needs to be changed. It needs to be a proper boss. It, it, it's just awful. It's just not good. So the fact that you can just 
throw deaths at it to do it and you know your actions persist is you know a kind of a cool twist on 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 the death mechanic in dark souls but it's again like most things in that game that that persists through death it seems to me that they couldn't balance it so that that was just their fix you know quick and dirty fix just just let that function like that yeah i don't know what if there's a better way to do that maybe it should only link to certain areas i thought it was the first time i played it i thought it was going to link to the tomb of the giants because you can see it right when you get down there you can see it in the background and i thought for sure there was going to be an area that linked down to it and there do seem to be paths that are in lost isolith that go nowhere there's one that leads out from from lost isolith proper that has a one of those headless demon titanite guys dispensers and i think behind that is where you can find solaire right when i first got there and i went down there i thought oh wow is this going to lead back up to the top or to some other area and it didn't so yeah, I, I think I think the potential is definitely there. I think that would be pretty cool. So if you could find a way to get Lost Isolith Link to Duke's Archives, Tomb of Giants, and to somehow, I don't know how you could do it, New Londo, I think maybe that could be pretty cool. Does anyone chat have any ideas for what they, they could do with it? Just remove it from the game? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I like the descent to Lost Isolith. I like everything that happens after Quelog's domain. You know, that big area with all the Taurus demons and the Capra demons. And the Fire Sage is alright. The Centipede's alright. They're not awful bosses. They're okay. Better Chaos is terrible. You know, I, I, I think there's some merit to them, you know? I think if you just removed it from the game, I think Dark Souls would be overall weaker. Not by much, but I think it would be weaker. There's a feeling when the first time you play Dark Souls, if it's your first Souls game, that I think most players are going to think around the time that they get to Lost Isolith, or if they go there sooner, you know, Duke's Archives or anything like that, where they think, holy shit, this is still going? You know? Now you play it and the game's actually quite short if you know where to go and you know what you're doing, but that's every game really, right? But I think that's a really strong feeling when you're playing that game for the first time, like, oh, like, holy fuck, there's, there's still more, you know? Yeah. And I think removing that would, would be uh, would, would, would make the game a lesser experience. Do you think it's possible Bloodborne's world was originally planned to be fully interconnected and not use warping a la Dark Souls 1? This might explain why you can't warp between lamps and the weird vestigial shortcuts like from the Peril Arena to Old Yarnum and the unopenable door from Cleric Beast to Cathedral Ward. My theories at Cathedral Ward, Upper Cathedral Ward, Central Yarnum, Old Yarnum, and the first half of Yargul were created first, then partway through development, Fromm gave up on the idea, which is when the other dead end areas were added, or maybe the dead ends were made because warping was planned as a mid-game unlock, maybe after Bergenworth. That would primarily serve as access to the dream of Mensis and as a way to get back to Cathedral Ward after the sprawling forest area. This goes back to the chicken or the egg question mentioned in one of your Dark Souls 2 videos. I wonder if the primary purpose of the Lord Vessel was only to elegantly get the player back to Firelink after Enor Londo so they could access the catacombs and new Londo ruins, or was it because Fromm felt like they ran out of physical space to keep tightly interconnecting the, the levels? To be honest, I haven't given this too much thought or examined the levels thoroughly to test if this makes sense. It's probably more likely. Fromm just added Bloodborne's useless connections between the levels opportunistically because the level geometry just happened to line up to try to recapture a hint of that Dark Souls 1 brand of awe. Wait, useless? For Dark Souls, I think that it's probably likely the Lord Vessel was only meant to be like a, a, an easy way to warp back after getting there. The way that I understand game development more now, having having learned a lot more about it since founding the channel, is that there's a lot of accidents, there's a lot of things that's thrown together, there's a lot of, you know, this 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 we this is a problem, and we're so deep into development that we can't really research a, 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 a really good solution to it. So what do we do? Is there anything that we can use right now? And I could I could see that they didn't plan the world can interconnectivity out far enough, or maybe they realized after they got to Anorlando that they needed more game and they need they added more to it. Um, maybe they, they thought things could be done in a different order and suddenly they're like, okay, well, we can't expect the players to walk all the way back from here all the way to the beginning, so let's put a warp in. And then suddenly they're looking at other areas that are really far away from the starting area and they think, well, we already gave them a warp, why don't we let them warp to other places? And, th and that's when you can look at it and go, well, why can you only warp to certain bonfires? Why is it that you can't warp any anywhere? And I think that was just the beginning of 
well, let's let them warp to th this area, that area, and that kind of sprawled out too. Okay, now we can warp to a couple areas here and there. And that's just me guessing, but that seems about right to me. And it also makes sense considering how interconnected the world is in the beginning and then it's not anymore. They obviously didn't want you to be warping right away. For Bloodborne, I don't see any of the same potential for interconnected levels in Bloodborne. There are some oddities that you brought up, definitely, and I think that it's possible that that's what they wanted to do, but there's only really one that links back, and that's from the, the forest up to the beginning of the game, and the rest are just kind of not really all that great. There's no internet connectivity between other levels. The broken door or the door unused door that stays locked isn't really that different. You could see that as, you know, you could have gone through Cleric Beast instead of Father Gascoigne. That could have been a choice early on, but I think at some point they realized that that's a too important of a fight to let go for some reason. I'm not sure what, what, what the thought is there. Having a different first boss would have been interesting, I think. I hate to say this because it's such a cynical outlook. I, I'm pretty positive on From overall, but I think that a lot of what they do is just... They, they stumbled into a winning formula and they don't know how to recreate a lot of it. Um, there's obviously a lot of plans and there's and there's some bits that get a lot of attention and, and, and a good amount of direction. Um, I'm not sure how much of that is on Miyazaki. Uh, there's a lot in Dark Souls 2 that I enjoyed that Miyazaki had nothing to do with as far as I understand it. And I don't know, I just I just think that the interactivity is, was, wasn't really that planned in, in, in advance as, as everyone likes to think it is. And if there was a lot of interconnectivity in Bloodborne, then it was just kind of stumbled into it and it wasn't intentional either. I think that a lot of the development of, of these games, especially considering how quickly they made Dark Souls 1, 2, 3 and Bloodborne, was just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. And they have enough raw talent and a good enough director that they were able to make that work. And I think there's a lot to be said about that and a lot to commend about that process, but I think that's when you get some things that are just really strange when you really look at them, because all the games have these odd moments and these these odd problems that you look at and go, how did that make it through? How did Lost Isolith make it through? How did, how, I forgot about Demon Souls, didn't I? So there's an, even another game on the list. How did, how, did, how did these things make it through, you know? And and you see all these experiments that don't really go anywhere and aren't expanded on, you know? Like, where's the expanded version of the bonfire aesthetic? Where's the exploration on the bonfire aesthetics? Where's the exploration on the interactive world in Dark Souls 1? Where's the exploration on the hard mode that's in Dark Souls 2? Where's the exploration on Chalice Dungeons? You know what I mean? Like, there's still no challenge runs in the game that allow you to do different builds and bosses. There's no boss rush, even though the bosses are something that people love and put a lot of work into. It's like, I feel like they're very, very talented developers, but at the same time, there's something really, really bad about them. Like, the games don't really run all that well, the visuals are really inconsistent, there's these weird graphical problems in a lot of them, you know, some bosses and hitboxes are just fucking awful, sorry kid, and just, I, I love them so much, but they're, they're so flawed in ways that I feel should be solved. I don't know, maybe it's just, just quick development times and, and, and they're just throwing things together, but then that leads, you know, more, more strength to things being accidents when it comes to stuff like the inter interconnected world in Dark Souls 1. Matthew Matosis pointed out that Demon Souls lets you listen to the Maiden in Black's intro speech or dialogue as you're choosing the stats to level up. And he proposed that it was because Miyazaki was not in Dark Souls 2 that the Emerald Herald, you have to skip it through. And that was a pretty good point that he that he, that he he had there. It's a point that a lot of people would, would usually have missed. I think I would have missed it too. That the Maiden in Black solution is just so much better because you get to listen to it and enjoy it while you're selecting stats and everything and you're not skipping through it. It's not an inconvenience. It's just, you know, part of you starts to hate Emerald Herald a little bit because you have to spam through this a little bit. But then you get to Dark Souls 3 and Miyazaki's back in the race car seat and the race car seat, the driver's seat, and uh, and you have the character that I don't even remember her name. It's the same problem as the Emerald Herald. So, what's that all about? Why is that back there? Is it, clearly, it's not something about Miyazaki. Was it some other developer? Do they not care? And I think that just kind of sums up how haphazard their development process must be and how rushed it all is and how there's probably tons of little problems like that that could have been solved and should have been solved. Okay.
or basically were solved already and they went back on it, you know? I talked about the Estes system and, and kindling bonfires as, as the best healing system in, in, in the second game that they made in the series, really, and every single system after that has been worse. You know, why, why do they keep changing humanity to human effigies to embers, you know? What's the point of that? Where's the consistency there? Is the lore is definitely not there as far as I'm concerned, so what's the idea? I don't know. I think that the developers simultaneously get too much credit and not enough credit. They get too much credit because I think that there's it's just it's just chaos at the from software house just just chaos cats and dogs living together in mass hysteria and also think that they don't get enough credit because they're in this they're in this system and they still make some absolutely phenomenal games and imagine what they would be like if they had more time and they had maybe better leadership i don't know i don't know if leadership's the problem so yeah I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what, what happens with uh, Sekiro, is that how you pronounce it? This is, unless I'm mistaken and I'm missing something, this is the longest development time that one of their games has had, right? However, they're also doing three games at the moment, so maybe it's going to receive the same amount of game development time, ex even though it's more years between projects because they're splitting all their resources all over the place, who knows? But I'm interested to see how good it is and how, how much it benefits from that extra time if it does it. And it's also breaking free of the shackles of, of Dark Souls and to some extent Bloodborne. It, it looks a lot different, you know, and it, but it's similar at the same time, but it looks a lot different. So I'm really interested to see what happens um, and, we'll, and we'll see. I think, I think it'll be really telling how successful this game is um, and, and what their development process is like. So to give a summary at the end to answer your question, no, I don't think there was any long-term or serious plans for it to be an interconnected world. They might have tried it or had lofty thoughts about it being that way at some point, but they went nowhere. They weren't serious thoughts. Nazgel says, I found it somewhat ironic how Soul series are famed for having a lot of actual playtime without having much cutscenes to interpret it. But when they do have cutscenes, it's mostly pretty medi mediocre. <laughs> I still can't get over the epic cutscene of Lothric Castle opening up it's is opening up is a simply a ladder dropping down and i think the game could actually benefit from removing most of them or having them play out in real time comparatively do you think god of wars no cut technique should be a new trend in video games that want to pursue cinematic storytelling yeah the cutscenes in souls aren't that great yeah there are some that are good and i think bloodborne does it better overall there are some really good ones in bloodborne Souls 1 has a couple. I really like the intro cinematic for Dark Souls 1. That's probably one of my favorites. There's certain scenes in Bloodborne that are really strong, especially one in Bergenworth. Yeah, I would say they're probably a mixed bag though. Yeah. I guess there's a distinction that should be made between the cutscenes that really have a big purpose and the other ones that are sort of like the, the, what you're talking about, the Lothric ladder dropping down, where it's just sort of like here's something opening, you know, or, or when you get to the cathedral in Bloodborne after Guest Queen, that's kind of worthless too, right? But I think the most of your question is about God of War, that it doesn't take any cuts and there are no cinematics and it's all just seamless, you know? For anyone who hasn't played God of War or didn't watch me play it, there's not going to be any spoilers for this conversation, but in case you don't know what we're talking about, God of War, it doesn't have no camera cuts, that's actually a lie. There are moments when the camera does cut away when you use the fast travel system. It's only for a second and it's probably not even worth talking about. And obviously there are also camera cuts when you open the map and the menu. So it's not always in range of Carlos. And that might be like, oh, who gives a shit? But yeah, well, Last of Us did it where it opened the menu right there in front of you. I think that Space did it too, right? So it probably could have done it differently. But yeah, there are moments where it does cut away from being behind old Carl. But for... The vast, vast, vast majority, when there's a cinematic, or the equivalent of cinematic, it transitions seamlessly from player having control to Kratos just running around and the camera staying steady behind him, or moving away from him to follow another character, but not in a way that there's a cut. It's like a cameraman is actually there moving from him to the other person, or the other focus of whatever the game wants to show. This is... cool at first? And I think it's interesting to look at and, and discuss and everything. But in the video, I will criticize it and wish that they hadn't done it. I do not think that this commitment to this idea was worth it. 
but again i want to stress that i do think it's it's interesting it's very cool um it's not unique but it's unusual and it does give a decent feeling to the game that other games don't have you know there's a sense that this is just this one long journey that you're on and and it's seamlessly going from one event to the next to the next to the next to the next but at the same time because they had to do it that way um fast travel is a pain in the ass to, to go through um there are scenes that you can't um go through quickly because it has to play out in real time and the worst one is that you cannot skip any of these cinematic sequences which is i, I i've said it before and, and and i'm really not kidding that if, if if i was to rank games out of 10 and your game doesn't let you skip cinematics or, or, or story scenes or movie scenes, you automatically get a point taken off your game. Just that's how bad it is. Maybe it should even be two. So your game could be 10 out of 10, like, oh my God, 10 out of 10 game, and y your cinematics aren't skippable, okay, you're losing a point. Maybe it should go down to eight, because it's just, it's so fucking stupid that you can't skip the scenes. Like, it, it just makes playing the game again just such a chore. I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate it in Half-Life 2. And playing God of War again, it wasn't quite as bad as Half-Life 2, but it was really annoying. Especially, you know, when the games have decent gameplay sections too that you might want to go back and replay, and, and now you have to sit and, and go through these story scenes again. It's not really a cut and dry sort of thing. There's pros and cons, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like it. I think you could probably make a really strong argument that any time that a game takes control away from you is a sign of weakness. If the game takes control away to show a movie instead, like if it's showing a conversation and it just kind of freezes your character, then okay, that's one thing, you know, that's not really a movie. And if they want to do some special camera work during that time, okay, maybe that's worth it. But if there's any moment where it cuts away to show you some big moment or some monster appearing or anything like that, and it looks really good, I don't know, you can make an argument there that it's not a game in those sections anymore, it's a movie. And when it's a movie, it's sort of like, it's not using the medium as well as it could, but visuals are a big part of the medium, so it's 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 not something that you can really put your foot down. But just imagine if if a movie at some point just cut away and, and put some writing up on the screen instead. You know, that's that's sort of what a game taking away interactivity is doing. You know, here we, we didn't film this scene, so here we just we just described it instead. Please read this. You know, and that, and that's sort of what a game is doing when when it's taking control away from you and showing a movie. What's the most immersive game you've played and why? Hmm. Okay, so there are two definitions of immersion as far as I'm concerned. The first is, so there are two, there are two kinds of immersion. So um, I got into, into an argument with someone on Discord once, I can't remember who it was, about immersion. Uh, or maybe it was on Steam chat. Um, I can't remember who, 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 who it was with. Um, they told me immersion doesn't exist, and I said that's ridiculous, and we got into a conversation, and it wasn't the most com wasn't the most uh, um, constructive conversation because it, it, they weren't arguing in good faith, uh, in my opinion. Um, the the crux of the argument was basically that gameplay is more important than everything else. Um, and immersion just gets in the way of that. Therefore, they don't think that immersion should exist because it shouldn't matter. But of course, immersion does exist. Um, th so there are two there are two definitions of immersion. Um, the there's immersion that is um, when you are immersed in a book and you are reading it and you don't realize that you're flipping pages. I think if you if you've read more than a book, that you've had that experience where you suddenly kind of snap out of it some something draws you out or there's a noise nearby and you kind of snap out of it and you don't really remember turning the page and you're like oh wait what what the hell when did i get to this page that's immersion you know you you are immersed in in the book you're immersed in the experience um you don't realize that the time is passing and when you watch a movie you kind of forget yourself for a little bit you don't you don't really remember who you are even maybe you know you get you really sink into the tv show the movie the the, the game the book the whatever you can get immersed in, in in washing dishes for fuck's sake you know you you get really into it you become kind of one with the task that's immersion but the other definition of immersion is this game which is um they they made the roads look authentic they made it sound authentic you know the ins the inside of 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 the truck is is uh 
hey, we didn't crash, we just came really close. The inside of the truck looks like what an inside of a truck really would look like. I don't know if it is, I'm just, I'm just using it as an example. Um, there is a there's there's a sense of a good sense of scale inside the truck it's all scaled well um it, it really makes you feel like you are driving a truck you know you really do feel like you are driving through europe right now you know the roads are the right size and it, this, the sky it just it's, it's it's this combination of scale visuals sound design um all all that stuff right all that stuff it's, it's a combination of all of all these details um that that's that's immersion that's the other kind of immersion um so what kind of immersion are you talking about i think you mean the second kind because um the first kind could be could be anything and that's not really that interesting of a conversation um the first kind of immersion just to answer though just in case would be um probably some sort of rpg um when i was a kid i would probably say baldur's gate 2 baldur's gate 2 was was the um was uh, was something that I would just lose so much time to. I would I would lose entire days to that, and not really realize it. Uh, World of Warcraft was very immersive in that kind of way too. Um, just a lot of game, a lot of games that take up a lot of your time and are you can sink into their into their into their loops or their stories really really easily. You know, I th I think that I would probably answer one one of those two. Um, for immersion in the, in, in the second way, which is when we get into arguments online because because people think that um, it's it's prioritized too much in modern games. Um, I have to say Subnautica. Um, even more than the Long Dark, it's it's weird to say because the Long Dark is 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 much more grounded in reality, but there's like Subnautica feels more real to me than the long dark i think maybe because you you have more freedom of movement i don't know um i would say subnautica um i would say in to, to the right person this game might be one of the most if not the most immersive game that they played or you know it's i think there's a lot of effort that's went into this being immersive and i think that's what the experience has it has going for it but yeah subnautica tries very hard to make it so the video game part of it is integrated in the game in some way. So the UI that you're seeing is the tablet that your character pulls out. The UI things that you see on your screen when you're swimming around are part of the scuba mask that you have on. When you get a warning and, and, and a, a little sound that's that's telling you, hey, you're about to die, like you get in a lot of games, it's the suit telling you so, kind of like the, the hazmat suit in Half-Life does. If you want to put down beacons and learn what the world looks like, you have to do it yourself, you know, you have to put down your waypoint markers. I really think that it, it goes a long way to contextualizing all of the gameplay parts of it. And that's before we even get into how the scale of the world feels right, how it sounds, how it looks how you can get, get in and out of your submarines and kind of zip around and it feels good it feels like you actually are underwater the whole entire time um the only bad thing about it is is a pretty big problem which is the bugs and the performance issues which rip you right out of it but i still don't think i can think of anything better is anyone in chat suggesting something that, that, that does it better minecraft i don't think minecraft is is immersive tetris attack well, that's immersive in the first kind of way, not in the second kind of way. I could lose like 45 minutes to that before I even realized. It's so relaxing. Arch Angle 7294 says, I would argue that there is another definition then, how well a game portrays its feelings and ideas, aka Bloodborne making you scared or Skyrim making you wonder at its horizons. Uh, is that immersion? I don't think that's immersion. You you are right. Like, that's definitely a, a, a strong... Uh, component of games and it's definitely worth discussing and it's definitely worth you know games doing more yeah absolutely um but i don't know if that's immersion maybe a connection or or you know you you have some emotion that's that you're drawing from the game yeah skyrim does have a, a great sense of wonder um so do the assassin's creed games yeah bloodborne making you scared yeah horror is really interesting to me horror is is arguably the best candidate for a game to really bust down a lot of walls and get to you because there's no other emotion i think that can be conveyed as clearly through a game than fear the only other one i think that you could really get is accomplishment and most games go for the accomplishment part of it if you play a game and you're getting stronger while you're in the game and you achieve mastery and you feel accomplished but that's on 
the gameplay side of things and with, with, within its systems and is usually the part that is very heavily gamified as well. You know, like the, 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 there are rules that you're learning, you're, it's a t technical mastery and you're getting through it, which is very, very, very important and very valid. And it's the thing that I value the most in games. Um, but it's also something I think is, is really overdone. And even though it's overdone, it's undervalued because people don't realize how, how strong it is in games. But I, I really don't think, unless there's a game that I haven't played yet, that fear has been effectively done in the way that I think it could be done. Because if you watch a movie or you read a book that's scary, there's always this disconnect that you always, always know that it's another character that is going through this. It's another person that's in control. You have no bearing on what happens. You have no influence whatsoever. You know, if everyone has watched a scary movie at some point and, and you know, you know something's going to happen and you're, you're either saying to yourself at the screen or you're thinking in your head, don't go in there. What the fuck are you doing? Don't go in there. Don't go in there. Don't go in there. Well, in a scary, in a scary game, you are the one that's in control and you can tell yourself don't go in there you you you, you can do that and and sometimes you still have to go in the room i think if especially if you played the game when you were when you were young and you were scared and you were impressionable that resident evil one might have been one of the most powerful experiences of your whole entire life because you 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 you're walking around this scary mansion that looked really good for the time and there are you know you you open a door and it has that 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 spooky load screen where it's completely dark and you have no idea what's in there and you're like oh god what the fuck is going to be in this room you know it's it's stressful you know like it, later on once you've learned the game and you know what to do and and you're a bit jaded you're a bit older it, does, it doesn't really hold up that well but um it's it's really like there's a lot of tension there's a lot of oh shit what, what what's going to be waiting for me behind here you know i remember being really scared to pull the the plug in the bathtub in, in one of the rooms because it was full of blood and you couldn't tell what was in there, you know, that 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 sort of thing, and I, I think that's the there's a really big difference between watching a movie and thinking, oh fuck, that guy is gonna die, and playing a game and thinking, oh fuck, I'm going to die, and the problem is, and I and, and I harped on about this in Inside and and in the Inside video that once you die in a game that even if it's the scariest horror game ever and you come back to life boom all attention has gone it's just fucking done and th that's why i think no game has ever really capitalized on the full terror potential of that feeling of oh fuck i'm going to die and I think if a game ever does that, or if it if it has, and I just haven't played it yet, I think that would be incredible. It would just be so fucking good. Now, I don't know how you would do it. I think it's a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, the, the, my, my ideas with it are, are you know, um, something that's close to a roguelite, you know, thing. Um, I do know that I've had, I've, I've felt more fear um, playing, like, permadeath runs of games, you know, uh, in Subnautica, you know, th then more fear in that game than than any other horror game ever. Pretty much, I've had I've I felt more fear in in and in, in tension playing like Enter the Gungeon when you know I, I only have one heart left and it's like oh shit you know one one hit and I'm dead you know like I I felt more fear in in, in Don't Starve you know because there's permadeath and Don't Starve but that permadeath also comes with a lot of tedium and a lot of you know you die and it's just like well fuck this I'm done with it so that's that's not the perfect solution but. Yeah, I, I, I really think that. But the, the question, to bring it back to the question, is that immersion? And I think, yeah, maybe maybe whoever said it in chat, maybe you're right. Maybe that is immersion. And if, if, if a game did get that right and, and made you feel truly, truly scared, then that would probably be the, the, the most immersive game that there, that there was for me. Uh, but for now, I'm going to have to go with Subnautica. Thank you to Sim Jabroni, who resubscribed with Prime for four months and says, Hey Joe, if you were to take four games with you on a deserted island to play forever, what would they be? Love your stuff. Oh wow, I don't know. Probably a 4X game. So I'd, I'd do research and find out what the four, best 4X game would be. Uh, my favorite is, is Civ 4, I think, with expansions. So maybe that one. Uh, even better if I can mod it. Um, probably Gungeon. That's my favorite re re game that I can replay over and over and over again. Um, and the other two, I have no idea. Maybe some linear game that I could try to get really, really good at and, you know, speed run it myself. Uh, Odyssey, of course, because that's just the best game I ever made. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the other ones would be. 
With internet access, I would say World of Warcraft, but I don't think I'm getting world internet access. But yeah, Gungeon, a 4X game, Dwarf Fortress. Uh, I don't know what the fourth one would be. I don't think I'd take a Souls. I, do, I have played Souls a lot, though, so maybe Souls would be like a, a comfort sort of thing. Micrologist says, Hey Joe, thanks a lot for doing what you do. I discovered your channel during a time of dramatic change in my life, and your videos really helped me through some hard times. I find myself thinking about Total Biscuit a lot in the, the past days, so I wanted to ask you a question about him. Most people agree that he was a huge influence on both the gaming community and industry. What do you think are the most important things he did and fought or advocated for? What are the things we should remember now that he is no longer there to remind us? Well, thank you for the kind words. I'm, I'm glad that the channel helped you through whatever you went through. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about Total Biscuit quite a lot too. Um, it, we, there was a lot going on when when he passed, and uh, but I, I even I even said to, to to I went and spoke to to Lily when it happened, and uh, oh we went to went to, went to the wrong lane, and um, I remember you saying that you were surprised, right? Because it seemed it seemed it seemed to happen quite suddenly since you know he he announced that he was gonna retire and only do the podcast, and then all of a sudden. Um, he 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 was dead. Um, yeah, I I was thinking about it a lot. Um, there there were di many different reasons. You know, there's there's just the 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 abstract reason of you know what happens when you die, and and there's just dealing with this person that that um, I only interacted with once, but I still interacted with this person that 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 is gone, just gone. Um, that that's what that's why I felt about when 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 my mom died. My mom and I didn't have a very good relationship, but um, it's still very it's still a very powerful thing that you go through. Um, no matter what, I, I think no, even if your mother was 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 violently abusive toward you, which mine wasn't, but I'm saying that even if she even if she is or was, I still think that your that your parents have such a huge influence on you that when when they die, no matter what, no matter who you are, it's still this thing that you uh, that you have to deal with, um, and, and it has a strong effect on you. Uh, the biggest thing that I went through when 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 my mom died was I just I I couldn't understand, you know how this person was just 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 gone, you know. Um, and I, and I was thinking about, about that a lot. And then I also had this the the, the, the selfish thought, which is you know, um, what if it what if it was me that was that, that had gone through this, you know? And you, and, you, and you think about your own your own life and your own death and and what you would leave behind and and, and, and what would happen, you know, that that sort of thing. You know, I, I think that's only natural. Um, I thought it was, and I still think that it's 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 very tragic and it's not fair. It's, it's not fair at all and that's what I kept thinking of you know as 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 the the days went by afterwards and there was a lot of kind messages and a lot of um, a lot of a lot of hateful messages came out too um, I shouldn't say that there weren't a lot there there were a couple I think that I overreacted to to, 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 to reading those and you know I said I wasn't I wasn't gonna cover cover Bioware games anymore because they they continue to 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 employ those people that said those things, and I think that was probably an overreaction, and I was being a little too a little too sensitive. Um, I definitely think they should have been reprimanded for what they said. I uh, just like this this new thing that's going on with um with the arena network or whatever with Guild Wars Two with these uh these devs these writers that work on Guild Wars Two that were acting like dicks on Twitter. Um, they were definitely in the wrong, but. I don't think they should have been fired. They have been fired. I don't think they should have been fired. I think that's way too strong of a reaction, um, even though they were definitely in the wrong. Um, yeah, I, th I thought about it a lot, and, and it's still, still, still in my mind. When, whenever I, I check the, the feed, and um, and uh, uh, TB's wishes were that uh, that Jenna, his wife, would continue to use the platform that he built um, to support herself, and 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 and. Uh, and their and their son and um it's it's it, it's kind of spooky you know when you're going down the down the the timeline and suddenly there's a tweet from him you know and it's like and it's it, every single time i look at it i go wait what you know like it, it it's 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 like it's it's not like a sucker punch but it's still just a little like oh wait what you know like oh oh right you know like it's 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 still it catches me off guard every time um the most important thing that I learned from Total Biscuit was something about myself, which was that 
years before I started the channel, Total Biscuit did a video on World of Warcraft. And I've never said this publicly before. I don't even think I've sold this to Lily. I watched it and I hated it and I left a really shitty Reddit comment on it. Uh, like I, I, I really criticized him really harshly. And you know, I took a lot of things he said out of context and I, I, I wrote one of those keyboard warrior kind of, what the fuck is wrong with this guy kind of poet, you know what I mean? And, um, I, I, as, uh, and, and it's like, well, fuck this guy, this guy doesn't know what he's fucking talking about. That, 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 that kind of comment on the Reddit post on his video. And this was, I think, a good solid six years before the channel started. And then I started watching the podcast. And uh, for some reason, you know, like, I, I, I gave his videos another chance. You know, that, that sort of thing. And I realized that I was being a complete irrational dick and I wasn't being productive and I wasn't being constructive and I wasn't being genuine and I wasn't being a good person when it came to looking at people that produce content you know um and I and I felt that way about other people on YouTube as well and, and people who write articles as well and you can latch on to one thing that they say that you disagree with and suddenly well, they don't know what they're fucking talking about they got this one thing wrong fuck them they don't know anything they don't know anything fuck them man fuck them you know and you know like Matthew Matosis thinks the Dark Souls 2 is, 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 is shit because, because of, because of, he, he can't dodge all, well, his whole entire channel is complete bullshit, and, and, you know, Noah Carol Gervais can't, can't fucking fix his audio, well, then his whole entire channel is bullshit, you know what I mean, like, it's, it's so easy to, to, to latch on to, to those, to those things, you know, like, oh, I, I don't think Odyssey is a good game, therefore everything I say is, is now, is now, irrelevant you know it's it's so easy to, to to do that and what i learned from 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 watching the podcast which i started doing a lot i watched almost every single episode of the optional podcast um uh, up to a certain point uh, i think before a year before the channel started i think i'd watched all of them i would put them on and i would play skyrim i remember i remember doing that quite a lot and i learned a lot about myself and i and i learned a lot about how i deal with things and that opinions that are are more nuanced and that there there's someone that you that you can disagree with on almost every single point and you can still respect what they say and you can still get a lot of value out for them if i had told him that that i that i was someone who left that comment because i don't know the chances are he might have read that comment and and he and he was and and that made his day a little worse that day you know so many years ago i doubt it but i read reddit, reddit comments so it's possible uh, maybe you would have been like, you know, fuck you, Joe. But you know, it's 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 uh, yeah, I don't know. So that 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 that's the that's the most that's what that's the, that's the the thing that I learned, um, from 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 him. And that could have I could learn that from anybody. It's not a specific sort of thing, but I did learn it from him. And that's my my weird story with with Total Biscuit. I felt sort of like a fraud when. Everyone had all these stories uh, after he died, and they're all posting on Twitter. And uh, Miracle Sound is, is has has his story. Sky Williams has his story. Day Nine, Boogie, uh, uh, Angry Joe. You know, there's lots and lots of people. E even s smaller YouTubers. Even even small YouTubers that I've seen criticize the shit out of him and call him an, an, an a Nazi enabler gamer gator piece of shit had had stories that were like you know he was still a good influence you know what I mean it was it was it was strange to see the same people that were you know retweeting him and and and, and really letting him have it for for reasons that I thought weren't valid at all and weren't fair were suddenly coming out with uh, you know with, with you know oh well it's sad that he passed and here's the good that he did and maybe there's there's some maybe it's not hypocritical but it was still there and I I, I didn't really feel like I had anything to say because um, I went I went on co-optional. I spoke with him a couple times in in in, um, in tweet messages on Twitter, direct messages. Um, we had an interaction on YouTube and we spoke a little bit before before co-optional started, but, but but that was it. You know, a very very brief interaction, and it was surreal more than anything. It was all about me. It was all about me during dur dur during that whole show. It was. You know, it was, it was basically the, the first face reveal. I was very stressed about it. Um, it was all about me because, because and people I think won't believe me, but the, I had a thought when I first put the Dark, Dark Souls videos up that what if the channel gets so good that I get invited on that podcast? That I, I thought that. How many how many people get to think that you know like oh what if that happens and and it's like it's like yeah whatever and then you laugh it off like there's no goddamn way and then it actually happens like 
what you know what I mean like that's that, that that's it, it blows my mind every time so it was it was all about me that 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 whole that whole interaction and I think it went okay I, I don't think I was you know um the best guest they ever had but I think I think it was all right but yeah that but so I, I felt like I was sort of a fraud because I had nothing else to really to really say you know on on, on Twitter after he, after after he passed um I think that he was a strong supporter of of consumer rights when there weren't many that were doing that um it's difficult to think and, and and to 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 really realize how different journalism has gotten and 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 the framework that supports uh, the communication between devs and and the people that buy games, how how different it is now. When I was growing up, you know, there it, it was it was all very clinical, all very everything's positive. You know, tell us so much about your great game that's coming out, you great developer. You know that that was it. You know, like it was it was all very um, there was a lot of control and there was a lot of you know. Uh, there wasn't a lot of criticism, you know. It's everything's so great, everything's wonderful. Don't even worry about it. And now we're in in this place where it's it's it, more most journalism is quite quite cynical. I think you can see see a little bit of, of, of that still exists though with with some of the IGN reviews and and you know oh it's a fake review and it's and they're paid for. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, and I'm not saying that it is, but I I think that's like the the leftover remnant of what that used to be like. And having someone who has such a large voice and has such far reach. That that is really going to going to bat for for making sure that developers are not you know taking advantage of of their of of their customers um, was really really important really really important. But um, what I th- really appreciated and and what I thought that he was the best at were the were the showcasing games um, in his What the Fuck series. I thought that was the best thing that he did, um, and it, it was so. It was so valuable to have a someone take the time to go through it and not just just give you brief thoughts on the game, but also show you it, um, show you what the options were. Like because you can tell a lot by by how competent the game's going to be, by what the options menu looks like. I think and and how much love and care went into it. Um, the uh, you know ports as well that that that, that sort of thing um, and just he he gave a shit. He really did give a shit. Um, there are lots of small YouTubers that have comments from Total Biscuit on their videos. Um, that because because he gave a shit. He watched these things. He he was a he was a strong supporter of YouTubers and, and new new creators as well. Um, he would he wouldn't pick games that he thought were going to be the most popular to do his to do showcases on. Um, sometimes he would pick like these these games that just caught his interest and he would and he would he would look at them. Look at the thing that went, went on Co-Optional, which I was surprised that they let me take part of. You know, I, I said can uh, at the end of Co-Optional they always do what's coming out this week and like I don't know if I'm allowed to say this because I I didn't sign anything I didn't agree to anything when I went on so I, I think I'm I'm allowed but you know they had a big goddamn spreadsheet of every single game that was coming out that week. Like like every game was on this spreadsheet that was coming out this week, and it was okay before before we start. Um, let's go through the spreadsheet and see if, if there's if there's anything worthwhile, just anything that catches your interest at all. There was no like, oh, make sure it's from a good developer or make sure that it's like no, it was no. It was just like basically just look at every goddamn game that's coming out this week, and and if anything looks good to you, even a little, just mark your name next to it, and we'll talk about it. You know, and I was like, can I do it? Because most of the times when I watch the show, it's just it's just you know. Uh, TB Dodger and Jesse that did it, and 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 the guest didn't. I was like, can I can I take part of this? And they're like, yeah, sure, go ahead, you know. And and I was able to, to you know put my name on the spreadsheet, and and yeah, and 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 it was and it was yeah, it was it was it was good, you know. He he actually gave a shit. I'm waffling, so I'll end with this one, which is that uh, FOV sliders are really important. Um, I say that unironically. It's gonna sound like a joke, but. Um, I didn't even know what an FOV slider was until he pointed it out in, in a video at some point, and I, I looked into it. I think I'm, I, I brought up the console in Skyrim or Fallout 3 or something and, and typed it in, and I realized that I really do need FOV to be at least 90, and um, I'll always be grateful for, for learning that from him. You know, F- FOV is really, really important. Lily found that out recently when, when you watched the camera phone that you got sick. Yeah, oh. F- FOV sliders are important, yo. They're really, really important. That was bad. It's 
really bad. What game did I pick on the podcast? Um, there were a few that I that I went through. I can't remember all of them. I mean, I I don't I don't want to 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 oversell or exaggerate or anything, but I was really nervous that day, and it's and it's kind of I didn't sleep very well, um, even worse than usual, and I, I was really nervous going on there. And once it, once it kicked in, sometimes I get nervous before stream, like even tonight, just a little bit. But other times I get more nervous than others. And once we get into it, I'm 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 fine. I'm not even nervous a little bit right now. I'm I'm good. So I guess maybe I have a bit of stage fright, and but once I'm on stage, I know it's not an actual stage, but you know what I mean. I'm 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 fine. You know, it's it's just I just need to get myself out there. Um, but yeah, I, I was I was really I was really stressed out um, to go on there. You spoke with Dwarf Fortress a bit ago. Would you consider streaming it, or would it scare too many people off? Uh, I think that streaming Dwarf Fortress could be really fun. Um, I think that it could be uh, it could be like a gateway for people to understand a little bit more about Dwarf Fortress. Um, the only bad thing about streaming Dwarf Fortress uh, is that uh, I haven't played it in a long, long time, and I'm really rusty and. I mean, the last time that I played that game, I think they just introduced beekeeping, or um, maybe it was just the one after they introduced the ruins. So we're talking about maybe maybe even 10 years. It's, it's been since I was really into Dwarf Fortress. Um, I played it a little bit um, for a video just to get footage, and it felt about the same, but um, I didn't get very far. Um, so we're talking a long, long time. Um, so I don't think I'm qualified to do a stream on Dwarf Fortress that could get people into it. But um, if I took some time and, 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 and played it over like a week or so and refreshed myself with it, I think it could be fun. But uh, so yeah, if I have the time, I'll do it. Dwarf Fortress, I highly recommend playing Dwarf Fortress with a tile set. It, it, it opened the game up for me and I don't think I could have played it without one. Have you ever played the Bioshock games? If so, did you think... What did you think of the gameplay and the story of the three games? Um, I played all three, if you want to lump Infinite in with them. I didn't finish two. Um, there's some DLC I, I, DLC I didn't do either. I don't think I did any of the DLC in any of the games. Um, Infinite is my favorite, and a lot of people just went, what? But yeah, Infinite is my favorite because it has the the most fun gameplay. Um, I don't think it it's it's has the best story or anything or anything like that. I just think it has the best it has the best gunplay. Um, I think R Rapture is the better setting. I think Bioshock One probably has the better story, but there are plot holes in Bioshock One that really ruin it for me, and there are plot holes in Infinite that ruin that for me as well. But overall, I think Infinite is the better game. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but I'm not the biggest fan of Bioshock 1. Even when Bioshock 1 came out, I played it, and uh, I, I, was, I, I was like, what? This is, it's like, it's okay, but it's not that great. Like, what? Um, I, think, I think that the best Shock game is Prey, then probably System Shock 2. Um, I didn't get far enough into Bioshock 2 to really judge it, and I don't really remember it all that well. Bioshock 2 might be better. Maybe that's better than Infinite. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry to, to burst some bubbles there, but yeah, there's there are too many too many plot holes in the games, unfortunately. Uh, I also played Bioshock on a, on on an Xbox, so maybe it's better. The gameplay's better on a PC. I played it on a PC, but I don't think so. I think I think the clunkiness isn't going to go away. I mean, the Rule Thirty Four from Infinite's pretty good though, right? Next question from Patreon, please. Do you have a game recommendation to somebody who hates tutorial lore and grinding but loves challenges and being able to test out if things work instead of the game holding your hand? Have played Dark Souls. What kind of game are you looking for? If you're looking for puzzle games, I would say anything by Zachtronics is definitely uh, up your alley. There's multiple solutions. There's uh, not very much hand-holding, and what hand-holding there is is probably mm. worth it because they have you know, a, a bit out there, uh, out there subjects. Um, I would say the same thing for, uh, for, for S Steven Sausage Roll. Um, but those are puzzle games, um, even though they, they kind of stretch the, the definition of puzzle game, all of them do. Uh, I would highly recommend Infinifactory as the Zactronics game. Opus Magnum is also pretty good, but I didn't play it much yet, but it felt very much like a 2D uh, Infinifactory. Uh, but I think Infinifactory is, is my favorite, and I hope they make a sequel. Um, Steven Sausage Roll is one of my favorite games. Um, no hand holding, very challenging. Um, you really have to think your way through it. Um, 
apart, you know, going away from that, it gets more difficult. Um, the hand holding part and tutorial part and seeing if something works sort of thing. Um, a lot of challenging games tend to have tutorials and and long introductions. Um, even some games that you can make challenging for yourself and you can see, like the part of your question was, see if something, see if I can make something work. Well, um, Breath of the Wild is really good for that. Can, can, can this work? Uh, Prey to some extent is sort of like that. Can, can this work? But I wouldn't say either of those games are challenging unless you're doing challenge runs, um, even on the hardest difficulty setting. Uh, I don't know if Hero Mode makes Breath of the Wild genuinely difficult or not, I'm not sure. But um, it's definitely a, uh, a, uh, a, a game that you can experiment a lot and you can see if something works or not. Um, I think Enter the Gungeon is a really challenging game, and, and there's a lot of flexibility there, and, and um, it doesn't hold your hand at all. Um, I would say that Enter the Gungeon is probably too hard at the beginning, but by the end you'll be wanting to activate the, the secret hard mode that the game has that is one of the best hard modes in any game that I've ever played. Um, if you like things that are a bit more unusual and frustrating, getting over it was something I ended up really enjoying quite a lot, and that doesn't hold your hand at all. Um, but it is frustrating, so be warned. You might want to check out a video of it first and, and see if it's something that you might be into. Um, I think Hollow Knight's really great, but it starts off a bit too slow, and I'm not sure if it qualifies for what you're saying that you want to see if something works and you can try it out, but um, there are some fun things that you can do in Hollow Knight, and uh, if, you, if you like Souls, it's sort of like a 2D Souls. Uh, I know how bad that sounds, but it, it really is, in my, in, in my opinion. There's 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 a lot of similarities there, and especially in tone and, and the way that the world is put together. Um, older games, um, I think Devil May Cry is really, really great. One and three. Two is is pretty bad. Um, don't play two. Uh, I don't really remember four all that much, so I don't know about four. But uh, if you haven't played them, yep. Uh, I can't remember how much they hold your hand or not, and uh, but yeah, they're, they're really, really good. In the similar vein, I haven't played it yet, but everyone seems to agree that it's even better than Devil May Cry. You might want to look into Bayonetta. Um, that, that might be something that you really enjoy. Um, I've heard great things about the wonderful 101, but I haven't played it myself. And every, it seems that every single video game analysis YouTuber has played God Hand except for me, and they say the same thing about that game, that, that, that God Hand is, 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 is fantastic, and you should play God Hand, and it's a deep system, and it's really, 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 really great. I'm trying to think of more recent games. If you want to ignore recent games, because as soon as I said recent games, of course, all I can think of were older games. There's a lot of games on, on the NES and Super Nintendo that, that qualify, you know, you just not much hand holding you just play the old Mega Man's Mega Man X the old the old Mario games especially Mario 3 that that's excellent and it's quite difficult um, especially if you play the NES version um, but you should probably go through all stars uh, Super Mario World on uh, on Super Nintendo um, has some pretty tough moments later on if you haven't played the older games but yeah i would say if if if, if dark souls is 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 the, is the the benchmark for you in, in that area that um you would unfortunately be be uh be you know you'd get more out of going back rather than around this time and you get a lot more stuff uh sorry a lot more of selection out of the older games um definitely uh, some new ones that pop, pop in my head right now uh super meat boy is, is is quite tough and um and, and doesn't pull back on the challenge. Uh, the, the, the beginning levels are a bit, bit basic, but you can get through them very quickly. Um, Celeste is probably my game of the year right now, and, and it's really, 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 really great. Um, very difficult, um, especially the secret challenges. Yep, I, I highly, highly recommend Celeste. Um, and there's some flexibility there too with, with some of the different moves that you can get if you're willing to experiment with it, but um, I think most people aren't going to really get into that until later on. Um, and there was another game that was just in my head. Oh, Revengeance. I really enjoyed Revengeance. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Um, might be my favorite Metal Gear game now, I don't know, because of the gameplay was just so, so solid. Uh, <laughs> the unintentional pun there. Um, yeah, I, I, I recommend that game. That was really, really good. Fury is a good first challenge. Yeah, I, I love Fury, but I'm not sure if that qualifies under, you know, w would this work or not. There is some flexibility in Fury, and, and you can squeak out damage and everything. Um, but I don't know if uh, if that qualifies for the for the more uh, creative combat system. But Fury is very, very good, and I, I enjoyed Fury immensely. 
Someone saying Ninja Gaiden. Someone saying Mist, Bayonetta, uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. It rewards creativity and it's quite challenging. Uh, the first three Metroid games. Ninja Gaiden Black. Are there any franchises you love but a particular game from the franchise that you hate? Thanks in advance, by the way. I love all your videos. The Devil May Cry games. I hate Devil May Cry 2. It's really, really bad. I otherwise love the franchise, but that's that's pretty pretty bad. I really like the Commander Co Command and Conqueror series, but I could never really get into the later um, the the later ones. The, the after Tiberium Sun, I couldn't really get into it. Uh, Generals was okay, but I'm I mostly like Red Alert one and two. But Red Alert three isn't that great. I, I didn't enjoy Red Alert three a lot. In fact, I, I I don't even think I finished it. I only played a little bit, and that was the end of that. But I really liked Red Alert Red Alert two. That's probably my favorite one. Um, yeah, not 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 a big a big fan of of the later Command Command and Conqueror games, unfortunately. Um, if they count as the same series, I love Total Annihilation, but I don't like uh, Supreme Commander. Um, don't know why I could just never really get into it. Um, it didn't. It felt soulless to me. There was. I felt like the robots and the units you controlled in in uh, Total Annihilation had more character to them, and there's something kind of really, really missing from um, from Supreme Commander. Uh, Super Mario series. I, I I don't like Odyssey. I think everyone knows that. I don't like Sunshine. Those two are are just really disappointing whereas the other games are fantastic um if if i can have a cheeky stretch of the question for the 2d marios mario is missing this is really really bad and disappointing <laughs> to you but i don't i don't think that should count yeah mario is missing pretty like pretty bad um yoshi's island is is fantastic yoshi's island 2 on the ds or whatever it was called was, was pretty good too but yoshi's story on the n64 was was dog shit really didn't like that game not good at all. Awful, awful, awful. Um, 2D Zeldas, or just Zeldas in general. Um, this is not a bad game, but I was really disappointed in A Link Between Worlds. I thought it was too simplistic in the dungeon department. And that's why I think maybe I was even more let down by Breath of the Wild, because I wanted more dungeons, because there, were, there weren't any good ones in, in A Link Between Worlds. And yeah, I, I enjoyed returning to the world of Link to the Past and, and the the different mechanics that it had. But yeah, the dungeons were really disappointing in A Link Between Worlds. Um, at the time, I didn't really care for Wind Waker, I don't think. Or at least it took me a little while to warm up to it. But now I think it's, it's, it's decent. This is probably a weird one. Uh, I didn't really... I really liked the original Star Tropics and I didn't really care for the sequel all that much. It's a really obscure answer, but yeah, I didn't. I don't even think I finished it. I was really disappointed in the sequel. Um, there's some Final Fantasy games that I really don't like. I I, I really love Final Fantasy VI. Seven's pretty good. Eight's pretty good. Nine is okay. I really really dislike Final Fantasy X. Um, I didn't really get into twelve all that much, and I didn't even finish thirteen. So. I think Final Fantasy X is where it marks the the, the, be the beginning of the end for the series for me. I know Final Fantasy X is the favorite for a lot of people, but I just I didn't like it. I didn't like the new direction it was taken in. Uh, if I can stretch the question a little bit more, uh, World of Warcraft expansions, Cataclysm was, was really bad. Uh, I mean, like it had some pros. It wasn't it wasn't the you know the worst expansion or the worst time to play WoW, but it was pretty disappointing you know on, on, on the raid parts and, and and everything else too really um, the best part were the five-man dungeons at the beginning because they were so so difficult and they required a lot of coordination it was really fun doing them uh, drain ore was pretty bad too really not that great um, and I can't really talk about Legion because I did because I didn't play it all other people hated Final Fantasy 10 nice nice how much more would you enjoy Fallout 4 and Breath of the Wild if it was called something different? Or the opposite, like would you enjoy Bloodborne if it was called Dark Souls 3? Uh, yeah, so interesting question. Um, it definitely matters. I wish that it didn't, but it definitely matters. So if if Bloodborne was called Dark Souls 3, I would be disappointed because it's such a departure from the series and I would prefer Dark Souls to be more Dark Souls-y. Uh, whereas, you know, um, even, though, even though I really, really, really like... Uh, Bloodborne, 
yeah, it would still be kind of disappointing. Like, I would think, well, well, is this what Dark Souls is going to be from now on? You know, that's I think that's why it is called Bloodborne. Um, so yeah, that's de de definitely good there. Um, yeah, and and Zelda was was a, was a bit um, disappointing. Sorry, Breath of the Wild was a, dis a bit disappointing because of that too. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it's 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 shocking to see that it matters. Um, Fallout's a little bit of a strange one for me because I didn't play the original, so uh, it did feel Fallouty to me, uh, especially considering how much Fallout is to do with the branding and you know the mascot and the presentation of Fallout. Uh, I would say that's a bigger part of Fallout than the, the equivalent in Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and 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 Zelda. Um, all the trimmings are there in, in Breath of the Wild. You know, you have you have Link, Zelda, Hyrule, you know, Ganon. Um, but the the gameplay is what's really really different there, and and that's what made it a bit disappointing because there there was no no dungeons that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, if if Bloodborne had been called Dark Souls three, I don't know if I would have been more disappointed than Breath of the Wild after you know it, it, I made the, the title of the video non of Zelda right. So I don't know I don't know that's a, that's interesting. The name definitely matters. Um, I don't know if I have any other point to make though apart from just agreeing <laughs> yeah it's, it's 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 really important i don't think i don't think it it should be but unfortunately it is right i don't know i was discussing it with someone on discord after odyssey and i said you know it's fine that odyssey is the departure in some ways from the rest of the series because it focuses on being this entry level casual game instead of being this more hardcore experience that i wanted and that's okay because you know it, all games don't have to cater to to everyone and he said to me and it was a really good point and he said to me that's true but you also have to remember that there isn't an unlimited amount of dev time and these are the only people that are making uh mario games and because they spent their time making this mario game you know you don't get another one of the kind that you like because they made this one instead and that got me thinking about how you know these games take so long to make and come out that you like you you can look at ahead and say okay let's say average life expectancy is about 82 right i'm 33 so am i still going to be playing games at 82 i hope so but you you can go ahead and say okay they take four or five years to make so how many mario games and how many zelda games do you really have left ahead in your life to play and assuming they make them forever and they're always good, which I think is a, a pretty safe bet. And, you know, because they, they spent th this chunk of time making something that isn't for you, I think it suddenly becomes sort of legitimate criticism that it's like, yeah, I really wish they had done something else. And, of course, the answer is a compromise is that they make games for, they have entry-level sections and they have good sections at the end for players that are more experienced and they don't forget their core audience that has been with them. You know, other Mario games have done that and they didn't do it that time. And maybe I should have really hammered that point home more in the video. It's probably a flaw that the video has. Kind of a weird, you know, realization. I think it's easy to think that, you, you know, you have unlimited time and so do the devs, you know, but that's that's not true. But then I've always wondered, would Breath of the Wild got as many 10 out of 10s if it wasn't Zelda? If it was just, if it was just literally called Breath of the Wild? And it was a new game by an unknown developer that just came out on Steam one day? You know, would it have gotten as many 10 out of 10s? And I would like to think the answer is yes, but maybe not. I don't know. Not sure. I'm paying you to make me a Bethesda-style open-world game. What would it be, and how would it be? Oh, and Josh, your voice. Oh, your voice. It's so crisp, tender, and nutty. It just melts in my ear. There you go. You're welcome. I'm surprised some people like my voice, because um, the first time I heard my voice in a recording, I, I cringed. Um, when I was when I was young, I, I heard my voice and I was like, oh my god, I, I sound awful. I'm surprised how many people like like my voice. It would probably be a mix of Breath of the Wild and Don't Starve. It would be 3D, um, and I think I would have. Uh, I don't think I would try to make make a story. I don't think I would try to have a lot of characters and and uh, and, and things to do like that. But I think I would have. A, there would be a, a focus on survival and acquiring resources. Um, there would be a leveling system, 
to reward you for, for getting resources in the world, but I don't think you would need it. You could beat the game at level one. Um, I think I would go for the movement system and the freedom of mobility that Breath of the Wild has. I think there would be a lot of climbing, there would be a glider, uh, there would be a lot of upgrades that you could find around the world that change those systems. I think I would be really for that, and I would try and put a lot of content that you could just stumble, stumble onto in the world. Um, and, and, and really reward exploration with cool things to do and find when you get there instead of you just show up and you get a reward right there for, for getting the thing. I think I think that's what I would do. I don't know what the setting would be. Um, po something post-apocalyptic. Post-apocalyptic is kind of, you know, a given because of um, because both Breath of the Wild and Fallout 4 are, are post-apocalyptic and those are the ones that I went with. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I think a, a really big open world kind of kind of thing with with Don't Starve's core core gameplay of setting up camps and a day night cycle and you're being hunted. I think I would really really enjoy enjoy that sort of thing. I think I could I could make that work. But it's kind of kind of like a pipe dream of throwing things together, right? It, it, it would probably not be as good as I imagine, and you, you have to t start with them all these ingredients in the pot and then trim them down really 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 finely. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I thought about making games, and uh, I don't think that would be anything that I would try and do for a long time if I got to make more than one game. Absolutely not. No way. Uh, but I think one of the most important things for me in an open world game like that, if I was if I was making one, would be to make sure that the gameplay and the and the combat is is really really worth a moon. It has to be better than Fallout's. Uh, and maybe just adding the, the mobility of Breath of the Wild with Fallout's sort of game uh, gunplay would be enough. Um, but Breath of the Wild isn't enough either. There needs to be more to it. There needs to be more freedom during combat. You know, having to stay locked on and, and, and the flips being, and the jumps and the dodges being so kind of clunky to use isn't great. Um, so there would definitely have to be some sort of some sort of uh, compromise there, or, or some improvements there. But I don't, in, in my head right now, I don't even know if it would be a shooter or if it would be something that's more um, more about melee combat, but maybe it'd be a mix of both, I'm not sure. I don't know, maybe, maybe it'd be better just to take the Blizzard sort of approach to making a game and just take something that already exists and just make it better. Just refine it, give it, give it a new coat of paint, um, make it your own in terms of story and presentation and your characters, obviously, you know, setting. But um, just take something that already exists and just make it much, much better and just iterate on it. The problem with, with Breath of the Wild and Fallout 4 and games like that is that they're so expensive to make and they require so much, such a long amount of time. Um, and, and they're still, like, Fallout 4 is still so buggy even though they, they've done so many games in, in the series and they've had so much experience with it that another developer trying to do that would be a huge gamble and I, I'm pretty sure some, some people have tried but it, it turns out to be a lot harder than they anticipate. Uh, obviously uh, you guys would be involved in the process of this Bethesda game. I, I would, uh, we would do polls to see what the setting is, you know? What, what's the art style? Is, is, it, is it anime? Like, I guess, I guess I shouldn't ask is it anime? What kind of anime is it? Anyway. Uh, yeah, sorry. I don't think that was a great answer, but um, I, I I don't know. It's it's it's. Uh, I really struggle with the open-ended question. Sorry. Riley P says, "Hey Joseph. Hey on, Riley. On numerous occasions, you have stated your desire to one day make your own game. Do you have any concrete ideas in your head already? A particular genre, maybe? Yes. It's all going to depend on the budget, though. Um, so." I'm thinking that the first game that I make is probably going to be coordinated through an online group, um, sort of like how Ori and the Blind Forest was made, and it's it's going to be you know we we, we get a we get a programmer or two, uh, we get an artist, uh, we contract out the music, and we all work together in, in, in that sort of thing. Um, I don't think having you know an, an office and a workspace and everyone goes into the same place and we actually have we work physically in the same places is going to be feasible for the first time through but maybe i don't know maybe i'm wrong about that uh, it's definitely not going to happen in Moncton. let's put it that way uh, so a lot of it's going to depend on the budget and when when i pull the trigger and and try to do it and i don't know when that's going to be i've done some math already and if if i'm if i'm using my own money if i'm funding it myself completely whole uh it's probably going to be about a million dollars so that's years and years and years and years and years and probably houses being bought and flipped in real life not just in house flipper you know that sort of thing you know we're, we're talking a long time um 
but or it could be or it could be funded through something like Kickstarter or um, maybe I could I could learn how to program and do some of the coding myself. Um, I want to do that anyway. But again, this is these are really really long term plans. I don't like the idea of doing Kickstarter, but um, maybe that's the that's the only thing we can do. But um, hey, a lot of Kickstarters are very very successful. Um, look at Hollow Knight, right? Probably my favorite Kickstarter project that there has been. So. It's all going to depend on the budget. So my guess is that the first one is going to be a 2D game, um, and the one that I think is the most feasible and the one I could I, I think that I could I could work th the most would be something that's a bit like Stardew Valley. Um, I, I would like to do that uh, with a twist that I don't want to say because I really like the twist and I don't want to ruin the twist. Uh, but yeah, like a like a, a Stardew Valley type game. Um, I think I I could make that really put together quite well and I like the genre I really like it quite a lot and I would want to really focus on on the interaction of the end game and have a lot of end game end game activities to do in in a sort of Stardew Valley package sort of thing um, but I don't think I would want to have that sort of setting I think I would probably do something a bit more creative um, or not creative because that implies Stardew Valley isn't isn't creative I, I think I would do something a bit more um, uh, uh, unusual um, I think you know like like a having having a farm on on a space station would be would be fun you know that that sort of thing I would really enjoy that um, the other option that's sort of in a similar kind of area in fact they might even uh, if, if it if I do something that's more more sci-fi and they might be combined together would be a, um, a factorios type game that's based in an entire solar system instead of one planet um, I like the idea of combining factorio and anno together uh, it's particularly Anno 2205, which has you um, linking different regions that you're building in with, with, with products and production change that you're doing. Um, I don't think 2205 does it nearly as well as it could have, especially compared to 2070. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the idea of combining Factorio with that sort of thing. Um, so you have different planets and you have different resources that can only be built on one planet. Um, I don't think they would be completely open-ended. I think there would probably be set maps and levels on every planet that you land on, but who knows? It's like it's f formulating in my head still. Um, and I think I would I would really enjoy making production chains that, that you have to build ships and ship things between the different planets and maybe you have a, a central factory in space and, and, and you, you build different things and, you know, there are different challenges that are, that are on each planet. So if one's like a... An ice planet, then you you can't build too many warm things because it might melt the ice, and so you have to build it in a different way. Or maybe you can't have conveyor belts on certain levels that, that, that like Factorio has. So you need to have different sort of transportation system set up. I think I think that that would be interesting. I would really enjoy making something like that. Um, yeah, so I think most people were probably expecting me to say something that's really heavy on story or something that's kind of like Dark Souls, um, but no, I, I I tried to I'm trying to keep things more um, feasible compared to to compare to something like I'm gonna make a Dark Souls game with fucking 50 bosses and and it's gonna be great and it's gonna have Bloodborne's combat system with the SS lock system and it's gonna have you know like all 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 this all this all this stuff like no it's it's not that's not you know, feasible the first time through. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would like to, uh, I, I would like to get to stuff like that eventually, but I think I would start slow and learn a lot and keep projects manageable. And even in, even the ideas that I'm putting forward right now are probably too much. And I would eventually just trim them down and, and get something that's a, li a bit more streamlined and everything. But to answer the question with something that I find a lot the most interesting about this and what I've been thinking about quite a bit, because I, I, I like stories in video games, despite thinking that most of them are pretty bad, um, is that I would really like to make a game based on my books. I know that sounds weird, uh, but I, I, the, the way that I wrote part of them, uh, especially Bounty Hunter and Monster Slayer, um, is that the, 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 the way that they're episodic and they have you know, the, the worlds that I, that I made and created in those, um, I would like to take a stab at that of of of, um, of ad adapting my own books in, into into some sort of video game. I think I would enjoy that quite a lot. But um, that's after making a bunch of smaller games. Like that would be a big ad like a big project. There'd have to be like voice acting and and you know uh, 3D graphics and that sort of thing. Yeah, it would be a big thing. But yeah, I think I would really enjoy doing that. But this these are really long term plans. Really really long term plans. And they might not ever happen. I hope they do, but I actually doubt it that it'll ever happen. But it'd be cool if it did. So Kickstarter for Dragon Souls when? 